Um, so what have we worked on on the brakes? I didn't show this off on video taking these apart, but hopefully, maybe, I can quickly and easily pull this piston apart. Yep, the workbench is messy because, well, stuff gets worked on out here in the garage. And I probably do a lot of cool things out here at times and use cool old tools every once in a while. Let's see if I can pop this out for you. I, I just had it out. It should come out by hand. I don't know why it's being a monkey. There we go. Popped it out. There's the piston coming out. And that's almost enough. I've already done my best to refurbish these brake cylinders. These slave cylinders that go on top of the brakes. Um, this one is in fairly decent shape. Not too much uh, rust and corrosion damage. It's not fantastic. I don't know where to find these new. The pistons on the new idea, like the unit system and the gleaner, are the same, but I haven't found anybody dealing with them aftermarket. I put new O-rings in them. The O-rings are in the cylinder casing, not on the piston. Um, so that's all fine and dandy. The ones off the combine were useless. They were in really bad shape. The ones on the uni were good. Now, what else are we doing with the brakes? Well, these drums, I couldn't get any good ones off the combine. I got a good set of band pads that go around the outside of the drum here. And the back side to this drum, I got, uh, there was a couple decent you know, back pieces. Um, so the way this works is there's balls in these divots here. And then there's another disc, and then there's a spring that goes in these holes to hold the two together. And when you stop the band, the drive shaft goes through that disc piece. The band stops, so the disc piece kind of keeps turning, but then it presses out against the walls of the brake casing. Uh, to stop everything. It's, I feel like it's a bit of a Rube Goldberg machine. Why not just have this band solidly on the drive shaft and then stop it that way? But maybe the band brakes are too grippy. Like when you press it, they stop too easy. Um, which, I mean, that's the whole point is these are steering brakes. So I'm going to press the pedal and I want to lock that wheel up usually to jerk whatever around a little bit. Um, over here, here's, like, this one's decent. It's worn. Oh, that one's worn. This isn't one to reuse. I'm going to take this off, which I didn't show the cleaning of this. It's dirty. It's greasy. This one isn't too terribly greasy on the back. Um, but we're going to go ahead and clean this one up, too. I'm not going to show that. That's boring. You guys can figure that out. This is the set of band pads that I got off the combine. I think you can see there's a good amount of pad left on there. These are good. They go around as such. Um, so yeah, this fun tool, thanks to Herman, which we're going to finally show off in action here, is a brake and clutch pad riveter. Um, it's very bright thanks to the light. Look at it from this direction. Uh, modern ones that you have to order online have a screw instead of a lever on top which I would sometimes prefer, but this is a lot quicker to push down versus sitting there and screwing and going down with it. But I think that's kind of neat. This is a really cool tool, um, very rare. Um, nobody uses this anymore. I mean, you. I was lucky. I could have bought these pads aftermarket online for, I don't know... I guess cheap enough. Just the pads, and then bought the rivets. I actually found these local. There was a somewhat local industrial brake and clutch shop uh, not too far from here. I feel like... okay. Let's start from the top. So I've already got four done as practice, and we've got sixteen of these to do per disc, and I'm going to do this for essentially two discs. One side of the picker 
is in pretty good shape. So we're going to work a little bit to get it on. Luckily, it fits down in the center here. And the disc has... Um, what's the word for it? Not notches, not grooves, but the holes for the rivets are countersunk. For the rivets. And we can line that up with the bottom piece of the rivet tool here. And this takes some weight and some oomph. That's why it would be nice to say have the screw type. But I'm not too picky. There's another one done. Um, so there's a little bit of muscle. We're going to slide it on. This piece goes in that countersunk hole and helps and pushes the rivet up. And the top of you know the pin going down here is shaped to perfectly mushroom the ends of these rivets. I mean, these rivets are solid, but the very end of them is hollow and designed to be mushroomed out. I think that was enough. Yeah, that was enough. There's another one. Another one done right there. Now I put enough rivets in. These rivets, I just put eight in to get started because they were staying in place without needing any assistance. There was enough bind of tolerances or something that these would stay in. I was afraid I'd put them in and they wouldn't stay before crimping them. Then I'd have to sit there and figure out how to hold them. But see, this seems more interesting to watch than me cleaning up all of the rest of this stuff. You can see that everywhere. But you don't see too many folks putting on their own clutch and brake pads. I mean, it used to be a thing a long, long time ago. I don't know, probably up until the 70s, maybe even the 80s, obviously on older vehicles, that, like, for clutches and even brake pads, that you could get new pads and rivets and do this yourself instead of buying the pads already attached to their backing material or plate or whatever you want to call it. But anymore, they're all just glued, except for clutch discs. But most of those come pre, um, pre-assembled, pre-riveted. So that's no fun. I gotta come over here. I got a big box of these things from this place. Full of these rivets. Here's what one looks like. Kind of can see the hollowness there. Um, at least it'll show up nicely on the black background of my glove. Or if I use a pair of pliers, it'll be easier. That's kind of the shape of it. And they're hollow until about there, and then it's solid to the cap. Um, to get these out, I just drilled them out. I just I picked a drill, but that was slightly bigger than the hole um, for the rivet to drill out the mashed over part. And uh, then just drove it out with a nail because the nail was the right size for the hole. Here is the other side of the drum setup. It's kind of a mirror image, you know, with the divots for the balls and there's the rivets. And I guess I'll show you guys how I drill out the rivets. Um, how did I figure out drill bit size? Well, I took one of these handy dandy rivets up to a drill sizing gauge and discovered that 1364s matched these rivets like they was it was just a small bit bigger to drill out the mushroom here that it would drill out the walls we'll say and then once i got down to the cast iron here you know it stopped and really what happens is the ring will actually ride up the drill bit. I can see that. Um, it won't knock them out. I'll have to, you know, punch them out. But I can put this bit in the drill. Lose the wire wheel. So I used that to clean up that drum. That drum was oily. That gleaner had some leaks. That drum did come from the gleaner. So I guess I'm getting a few parts from that old combine. 
if I had to buy that drum from somewhere, like Steiner, uh, I think they wanted like 130 bucks just for the drum. It probably already had the brake pad on it. Now the pads aren't too bad. They're, uh, I don't know, 12 bucks a piece roughly. Okay, so we made a lot of nice ribbons. And unfortunately, the ring cracked on this one. And you can't see it because my finger is dark and it's dark. Well, let's move you guys closer and get right up on top of the action for this one as we drill one of these out. Let's see it up close and personal here. The brass drill is really easy, so it's really easy to get into the casting. But voila, there is the ring up the bit. This is actually going easier than the other one, or I'm just putting more pressure or something. Or I know what I'm doing now and know what to look for, that it's quicker. I probably did drill out some of the casting on the other piece. So we get the idea on how to drill these out here. Well, now comes the fun. I have them all drilled out, and I found out that uh, this nail, 16-penny nail, is about the right size. It's a little bit smaller. At, uh, once we get it moving, a couple more taps. There, we hear it fall out. So that was a very bumpy ride on the camera, tapping them out. Now let's see what happens. I got them all knocked out. So when we lift up, that is a very rusty piece there. And this is the remnants of the brake disc. You know, kind of not in great shape there, of course. Well, it's time to clean the rust off. I got the big wire wheel on the corded grinder because this thing takes some ponies to get turning and then it eat batteries alive and we'll clean this up make this surface shiny so we feel good um that's all there is to do to it the new brake linings are glued on i don't know if that's available uh for common folks like you and i um, but it would also make it a bear to change these out in the future uh, so I guess I just get riveted on and hopefully put them on a nice clean surface. Uh, which hopefully they don't get any moisture and rust, but if they do, that'll make it tighter because the rivets will be holding it down and the rust will be behind or it'll just rust and crack the brake lining if it gets too thin. One of these did do that. It was so thin that it just started to, to bubble up in between the rivets because there wasn't much rust behind the disc. <laughs> I like those braided wire wheels. You can just about grind things smooth. They're that stiff and sturdy. Uh, but that we got a good shine here. Time for another disc. We got a couple extra of these, maybe in case I mess up or something. And we try to get it lined up with our holes. And we'll see how many rivets go in. We'll say a little bit firm here. If they do, the first one won't, but if, the, if we get a few of them to go in kind of firm-like, then we can just probably stick them all in and have fun pressing, pressing them in. Yeah, this bottom section is springy, but there is a solid, like it's hollow, and there's a solid portion down at the very base here that does stick up just enough to fit the countersink and the brake disc material. And the top, which I can't really show you in there very well, has got like a ripple, like mushroom thing going on, if that makes sense. Now this could be a little bit um, easier than the drum piece. I'm testing to see how many of these fall out. Two of them did. We'll start with those. Because I don't have to put the whole piece over the handle. It'll just fit in from the side nicely. Okay, feels like we're centered on the rivet. Good thing I got a little step stool, because it, as well as I oiled this up, 
it is a small challenge to crimp that down. It feels like we bottomed out. Looks like all the other ones. Okay, well, we'll keep going with this. Now there's the back side, a bunch of smashed rivets. There's the front. All nice and freshly resurfaced with brake material. Uh, but I did find something interesting. I don't know if you can see it in the light. Right there by my finger, in the casting is stamped Bendix. Yes, yeah, so I didn't realize that these would be Bendix brakes, but I guess they dominated the brake market back in the day. At the, and the number below it is 312495. Didn't know this. Didn't know that number or the Bendix stamping was there or existed. And where did I get these lovely brake discs from? You can find them online from Steiner. Or if you're in my area, and you'd probably know if you were, you go to this place. Industrial Brake and Supply. Uh, and they have many materials and parts for resurfacing brakes and discs. And uh, they got a lot in stock. Now, they didn't recognize these from the combine, but Case Backhoes used these. And as soon as I sent them a picture of what I had, um, the fellas down there knew exactly what I was working on. Or they'd seen it before. So it's a good thing that these brakes were used on a couple different machines. Got to quick polish up my ball divots here. I don't know if detent is quite the right word. But we'll shine them up, make sure they're clean, and then I got to polish my balls and put them back in here. Anybody want to know how to polish your balls? I don't know if this is a good way, but we got our nice, lovely, greasy, pre-used rig here. Um, this one fell into the, some grain dust because I had these sitting on top of the feed box. Because I had to stop and feed cows and was carrying this thing up to the house from the barn. Now, these aren't new. These aren't great. That's about as shiny as they're getting. Yeah, the surfaces aren't shiny and factory-like, but we're not putting together ball bearings here. But this is probably about the uh, tolerance quality I imagine the Chinese have when they're assembling bearings to send to the U.S. so things can fall apart in a timely manner. The time for assembly. And look at the profile of the spring. There's a hole in our brake halves. That the spring sits in and then the way wider base catches and there's a hook point. And there's two springs that hold this all together. I've got my grease needle on the end of the grease gun here. And I'm just going to put some grease down in each of the cups. Not a lot. That's why I'm not using the regular tip of the grease gun. I'll set the ball in. We'll do both halves. And then I'll roll the balls around a little bit in each one to get them all lathered up. Just going to roll our balls around a little bit, make sure they get all in the grease, push it around in the cups. Okay, I already did it over here off camera. And then this thing just sits in right like so. The fun part will be the springs. I mean, yeah, it looks good sitting in there. It's not super simple. And this one has to come up from the bottom and hook. So here comes the challenge. I'm going to have trouble showing off. Uh, but it'll be very important to have an awl handy to reach down in. Maybe even a hook, not so much an awl. But to hook the end and then work it over the hook there. Some of these discs are cut with a slot instead of a hole on the one side, which might make this easier. And you can't quite see it on camera, but my spring, I came up from the bottom with the spring, 
um, in the drum there's a hole that accommodates the spring shape. And this is probably where I really need a pick over an awl to be able to pull that spring up. Well, I'm getting the second one on. That one just set down into place. Really, this punch, or even a flathead screwdriver, uh, was my best friend because it could reach up in the bottom of the spring, you know, reach up there, and I could push the little hook piece up and get it to where I could see it and reach in with the awl. Like I said, a hook or a pick set would be uh, useful here, but I may do without. So, do it yourself. It's going to be a bit of a fishing game. This is not easy at all to get the springs in. Brake springs are never easy. I don't know if brake spring pliers would help here at all. But we're together. Um, you know, one big happy drum piece with two halves. So this has been a fun bit on redoing brake pads.